by the name. We had we had a, 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 a lecturer by the name of Professor Yuri Leroux. And Yuri Leroux was an Old Testament lecturer. I don't know if I've told you this story before because sometimes when you you are getting older, you, you forget that you've told uh, this group a certain story and you keep on repeating, repeating, repeating. Then every time when Professor Yuri Leroux start his his session his sessions of, of of lecturing for those particular seven weeks or eight weeks in the first class where he introduced the theme of that module handing out tutorial letter talking about the assignment whatever the classes how are we going to go about that particular module he i, I remember him he he always love to say uh, colleagues or students or whatever, we need to take this opportunity or this classroom that we are at. It's like our laboratory. When you enter into this class each and every time, you must know that we are coming to test some theories. We are coming to test some knowledge. We are going to agree on things and disagree on things because it is where we are doing our scientific study. But the advice that I'm giving you as your, as your lecturer is that after we have done that, when you go out to the world, you must be a responsible person. Then with, with those words, my brothers and sisters, I'm saying uh, I've been requested to come and talk about the significant or implications of decision making and I'm not going to talk much seriously I'm not going to talk much I'm just going to introduce this to you and I want us to to reflect about the issues surrounding decision making and I also want us to reflect about what is happening especially in our church uh, the Uniting Reform Church in Southern Africa like the recent event that has happened into the church, but when we do that, we must consider, we must become responsible people. When we go out to the public, to the world, we don't write on our Facebook or when we preaching on Sunday. Even at our previous contact sessions, we said this and this and this about the church. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. We just want to understand what is happening in the church and how are all these things uh, unfolding into the life of the of the church. But if I had to go to uh, my, my engagement with you on the issues of uh, decision making, I really want to, to, to thank uh, the organizers of this particular contact session to have a session of this sort, especially during our time here at uh, members. And I'm saying this thing because one of the things that you are going to do, you are now theological students. In a year, in two years, in three years, in four years, you will be a licensed, but also you will be ordained <clears throat> at different congregations. And when you are ordained as a minister, you must also know that a minister becomes a permanent member of the church council a minister becomes the permanent member of the presbytery. The minister becomes the permanent member of the synod. It means in the church council, you'll always, you'll always be there. When governing elders are coming and going, they serve two years, they can serve another two years and they rest. But if you'll be saving that particular congregation for 10 years, it means in those 10 years, you will be a permanent member of that church concern. There won't be time where they say a minister must go and rest like elders, unless if you take a long leave or you take a, some sabbatical and do some things, but you are a permanent member, but you are also a permanent member of the presbytery. When congregations send delegates to the, to the presbytery, uh, they, they, they rotate, but you, will always be part of that presbytery until you move to the other one, until you retire or until you decide to 
take another calling, but also in the synod. Then that is, as a member of the, of the church council presbytery synod, there will come a time when you are making decisions. There comes a time when you sit down and you make decisions. And some of the decisions that you will be taking together with the members of that particular uh, church council, presbytery or synod. There might be decisions that other people love and decisions that other people do not love. That is the nature of, 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 of humanity. There are certain things that you will never favor them. There are certain things that you can favor. But the issue is that uh, decisions must be, must be taken. But then what we are talking about today, we are talking about something, the implications, significant, the, 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 the effect of the decisions that you are taking. Whether it is a church council meeting a presbytery synod or whether you are, you, you are counseling a family and then when you are helping them into that counseling, some of the things that you put on, that you put on the table, uh, people make uh, decisions and choices. But in order for us to understand this whole issue of decision making in our, in, in our, in our church, I, I want you to go with me some, some two, 200 years ago. <clears throat> the arrival of Jan van Riebeck in 1652 didn't bring only the so-called religion, uh, uh, relig uh, Christian religion, but it also brought about the Western ways of doing things. And when we read from different books, we are told, especially in church history, that in the first 200 years, even though there were certain things that were not right there and there and there, but in the first 200 years, we are told, especially from the Dutch, uh, Dutch church uh, perspective, that the church was one. Then around 1800 and something, 1800, and 15 and 20 and 30, some of the presbyteries around Cape Town, they had a challenge of sitting together during the communion table with people of color. And they've made something called a prescribed spending, things that needed to be discussed at the synod that certain presbyteries have brought together the motions that we need to have separate worship service, especially during uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Eucharist celebration. And that uh, motion, firstly, it was rejected because some people thought not uh, uh, put to, to, uh, to test that uh, this, is not, this is not a Christian way of doing things. They were rejected, but again, People brought again whatever uh, more motions regarding the issue of, of separation. Until in 1857, then in 1857, the Cape Dutch Reformed Church Synod took a decision. And that decision came to be known as for the weakness of some. Let us have communion or Eucharist separately. But little did they know that with that decision for the weakness of some, let us have communion separately. That they were also planting a racially segregated churches. That is why from the Dutch Reformed Church perspective, in 1881, that is when the Dutch Reformed Mission Church was formally constituted. The church was one, but now 1857 decision that say for the weakness of some, let us have communion separately. Yes, communion was, uh, was instituted uh, separately, but by so doing, they also stretch the whole issue of, of racially segregated churches because 1881, 
the Dutch Reform Mission Church was constituted. Later, 1951, uh, the uh, Dutch Reform Bantu Church, the, the, the Dutch Reform Bantu Church, which we, uh, was later uh, called Dutch Reform Church in Africa. That was in 1951. And again, 1968, we had uh, a, a, a Reform Church in Africa. The, that decision of 1857 made the Dutch Reform Church to split. Then we have now the Dutch Reform Church for the whites. We have the Dutch Reform Church Mission Church for the colored, we have the Dutch Reform Church for the blacks and the Reform Church in Africa for the Indians, just because of the weakness of sound. The, the, the decision that was taken then didn't only bring what we called a, a, a church, a church apartheid, but in 1948, when national part, the National Party took power, an institution, what we call apartheid policies. It means a stepping from what the church have done because the Dutch Reform Church has uh, speaking for, for apartheid. They've supported apartheid as the church because of the decision that they took in 1857. Then in 1948, when National Party the National Party, uh, National Party was, was in power, instituting apartheid. The Dutch Reform Church was also supporting them. It means the decision of 1857, it had an effect, not only in the church apartheid, but also in the societal apartheid. Then from then, we've seen many attempts by many people who were trying to, who, who were trying to speak against that decision that the church made in that particular particular year. One of the people who was so in, uh, uh, influential during that time, uh, a certain um, uh, Reverend Mokels. Reverend Mokels, like he, he, he fought against that decision, that, the decision that he took. That has led to what we call uh, apartheid. And uh, in 1948, you must remember that what apartheid meant then, uh, they call something like uh, a separate, separate development that, okay, all human beings in South Africa must be developed, but it must be separate development. The whites will always receive privilege of being developed. They are going to be more equipped and more developed. Where else the people of color, they are going to be equipped, developed, but not the way, uh, not the way the, way the whites were going to be, uh, to be equipped. Then in a part eight, it means that was as stemmed from the decision of the church. It brought about this whole issue of bringing two kinds of people. Like we have black uh, people of color who are more inferior to the white people. Then white people will always be the ones who will uh, sort of like being developed for their betterment. But from the people of color, it was becoming a problem. Then people like uh, Reverend Mokers, they took time in, 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 in opposing that. And when he was trying to oppose that, even the people within the Dutch Reform Mission, Mission Church and the people within the Dutch Reform Church in Africa didn't support him because they, they, they had that ministry of conform, is it, uh, conformity, uh, conformity that, that ministry of saying, no, but what can we do? Uh, no, Mokas cannot do this until Mokas decided to start a church uh, with his followers uh, that called Calvin, Calvin Reform, uh, Calvin Reform Church. And that Calvin Reform Church, it is the same with formulas and the way things are done in the, in the Dutch Reform Church. And the BK came in also speaking about that, but even the BK within the church itself, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't have a, that a free floating because some were saying that the same people from, from the Dutch Reform Church in Africa and Dutch Reform Mission Church, we're saying the BK won't become the church within the church. Then all these things happen because of the decisions that were taken. Then my colleagues, I'm, I'm bringing this thing to, to you uh, today just to, just to, 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 Can I request my, uh, my, my, my other colleagues here 
Elton Mohoje, maybe to mute. Yes, uh, there's, there's also Brother Mashlatsi and Mufukeng who are also on. Can you just please mute your microphones? Brother Mashlatsi. And I think Tebuchu Mufukeng at one stage also was unmuted. And there is 011227822. That's, that's Brother Mashlatsi. There. Okay, he's muted. Okay, I think. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with what I've just uh, put on the table, colleagues, I want us to maybe to engage about this whole issue of uh, decision making. When I was when I started my uh, this talk, I said, in your lifetime, after you have completed your studies, I know now you are making decisions, your personal uh, decisions regarding your studies whether you want to register so many modules, if you are married in, 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 your, in your home, things like that. But after your ordination, you will be a minister in your congregation. And one of the things that you will be doing beside preaching and counseling is coming up with decisions. Then the issue that we need to talk about is uh, like, how do you make decisions? Like what kind of decision do you uh, do you make and what influence the decisions that uh, we are taking? The first thing <clears throat> in our in our church we have this. I think it is also in, in a church order. When you start a meeting, we say we start a meeting with a prayer and a reading of scripture. And after the meeting, we say we close the meeting with a prayer. And when we pray before the meeting, we say God help us or be part of this meeting as we will be deliberately. I normally hear people praying such prayers that God come and be part of this meeting. It means when we're making decisions in the church, we need to bounce things with God, like uh, make decisions together with, uh, with God in our midst. And such decisions will help us that even if we've made a decision today and that decision did, does not bring unity to the body of Christ. It won't be a problem for that very same church council to go back and say, listen, we don't think the decision that we took, it is for the betterment of this congregation. When I started my ministry at Le Walk Home, there was this old man, uh, he was in the church council, in the Temo Lord. I remember in, in one of the discussion I had with him, he, he, he told me something like, Muruti, you know, when you are in the church council meeting and you, 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 you make a dis, like a decisions, not, not some like, uh, decisions are decisions, but you know, we have decisions in the church council meeting just to say, uh, it is now time to eat. It is a decision. We take a decision to go and eat. Those are just more than things. But there are some decisions that affect the lives of Christians. There are decisions that affect the lives of people. There are decisions that affect the spiritual well-being of people. Like decision not to know, uh, Mr. Swenso does not pay his or her pledges, Mr. Mrs. Mamang does not pay, then we're not going to bury that person. It is a decision that we're taking, but we don't, we don't understand the effect that that decision will be doing to the people who are uh, uh, standing behind, the family starts standing behind, not the one who have passed. Then he once told me like, uh, Muruti, if you make a decision and you sleep at night, you, you sleep peacefully at night, then you must not worry, you must know that the decision that you have made, uh, it is a good decision or a decision that would be the betterment for the congregation. But if you can make a decision and that decision does not bring you peace as an individual. It does not bring you peace and it makes you to like to keep on being in conflict with people. And he said, you must come and become a better person and say, I think that decision was not okay. Maybe we need to revisit it and look at it uh, somehow. Then I'm saying this thing to you, my colleagues, because <clears throat> you will be, you will be in the church councils, you will be in presbyteries, you will be in synod, and 
then you'll be forced some other time to make decisions that affect the church. And you must make sure like, when you start a meeting, we invite God, then we talk with God. In, in, in our deliberation, we talk with God, even in what we are, the decisions that we want to, uh, that we want to, uh, to make. Then I'm bringing this thing to you, my colleagues. I also want us to reflect uh, being responsible and mature people about what is happening surrounding us into our, our church and the decisions that we are taking. As I've said, I'm not going to speak too much the chairperson, let me leave this thing here for some engagement. And please, you must also know, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> some of you must help in answering, even if uh, it is not what we, we expected that, uh, that answer to be the way we wanted, but let us just engage into this thing. I thank you, chairperson. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Reverend Pamponia. All right, um, there was a question whether we can get your uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know if it's, if you've written it out or typed it out. If you have, please just send it to, to uh, Brother Zanele and he can uh, circulate it to everyone. Questions, comments, decision-making and its consequences. Uh, please put up your hands if you want to speak. Tap your hand if you want to speak. Who wants to go first? Yes, Brother Tutu, I see your hand is up. You're over to you. Just unmute your microphone at Brother Tutu and then you can speak. I see he's still connecting. Seems to have a connection problem. Anyone else in the meantime? No, he seems to have lost us. Anyone else? Yes, but there's Anele, your turn. Thank you, Professor, for the <clears throat> for the opportunity to speak, and thank you, uh, Moriti Maponya, for your wisdom and guidance. Uh, I just want to look at a typical issue here, because from what I understand, the Church Council does not actually take decisions for the congregation. They will take a resolution, present it to the congregation. Then the congregation is the final authority of they will basically give their approval on a decision. Uh, am I correct in, in, in that assumption? Uh, we, are, we are called a, a Presbyterian system church. And that means the church is governed by the church council. Uh, the congregation, uh, Denominations where congregations make decisions, they are called congregationalists. But in our case, and maybe, maybe I stand to be corrected, the church council is the legal persona, the presbytery and the synod are the legal person. They can, they, they can sue and be sued. Then they are the ones who governs. They are the one who, who sit in a meeting and they come up with a, decision. Yes, congregations are involved because some of the elders are coming from different wards and some of the issues that church council discuss, they are coming from the wards to be dealt with at the church council. But at the end of the day, the church council is the one that makes decisions. Uh, maybe I can just complicate the matter a little bit there in Maponia. Um, what, what I, I, I agree with your answer, but let me complicate it. In Melodia Tswane, I've heard people say, you know, at the announcements, uh, the church council asks us to pray as members for the meeting of the church council, sort of one week or even two weeks before the meeting 
meeting is announced and we are asked to pray. But then after the meeting, we never hear about that again. The church council never reports back to us, never tells us what decisions they took. Um, yes, our ward representatives, elder or deacon or whatever were there, but they don't report back to us usually. So how is this that you take decisions for us, you want us to pray for you, but you very seldom tell us what decisions you took. Is, is that being a good representative leader of a congregation? Is there maybe another question before, before he responds? Any other, other comment or question about decision making? Okay, uh, Ron Pamponia. Yes, Shepard Sinol. Uh, one of the things that I normally teach to church councils where they've invited me to conduct a workshop <clears throat> regarding uh, the duties of a minister, uh, duties of elders, uh, leadership, whatever, whatever. I normally make this statement that the church council should not, should not create a bridge between them and the congregation. Because as a church council member, you have been, you have been selected from the pew and you have been set apart to come and serve God's people. That is the first thing that uh, uh, things need to be to be conducted. Then when you've been set apart, you don't create a bridge between you and the people and say, no, but the church council was sitting there. In, in, most, <clears throat> in most church buildings, the church council, they even have their, you know, like the, uh, their place where they stay, like we are there. And here is sort of like a bridge or an ocean and there is people. You don't even report to people about the finances of the church or what is happening. But the experience that I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm currently having with the congregation I'm serving in Polokwane City, we, we normally engage the congregation, especially on matters that we think these ones are, are so sensitive. And, and if we, can, we cannot engage with them, then it, it can create some tension uh, around, uh, around our, uh, our, our congregation. But I think it, it, it will be proper that when we ask congregation to pray for the church council, when we take decisions regarding other things, we need to come and speak. But others will say, no, but we have conference once a year where we report about everything that is happening. But that will just be my, my submission. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, let's engage. I'm sure you, you were stimulated to think Think something while you heard Mabonya speaking. Yes, Brother Fukas, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. I, I have read Reverend Mabonya indicating to us about the, the presbytery, the church council, and the snow. So I just I just wanted to ask, I've I've uh, got the conversation in the middle. But my question is basically upon the appeal that one needs to do from a synodical point of view when the general does not have made a decision. Uh, we all know what happened. And a member of a modern man will need to appeal where a member appeals. In most cases, we know there's a body that most people need to go when you need to go and do an appeal. So I just wanted to ask that question. If you need to appeal when you are in a general level of a modern man, and the general synod have made a decision, where do you appeal? Thank you, Chair. All right. Um, let's just hear if there any <laughs> other question before even the Mokwena uh, answers. Oh, well, Maponya answers. <laughs> President Sele, sorry, I, I don't see your hand, but please go ahead. Sorry, in Kobezekwa, Kenelemong. 
thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Muruti Maponya, thank you so much, <laughs> Ratu, uh, for your uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation. Uh, I, I liked how you, 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 you brought it up to us from the background. And today, the church is, 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 is challenged. And the leaders of the church are there to take decisions, not for themselves, but on behalf of members of the church. Now, you gave an example of saying a minister must take a decision, the church council must take decisions. Uh, you, you, you gave a background, a nicely background of all those things. So now when I'm checking uh, the dynamics of decision-making in the church meetings, uh, what if some decisions will be taken and will just break the church, whether into two or into three, should we stick to those decisions? Because those are the dynamics that are brought by the decisions, or those will be consequences or results that will be brought by those decisions that are taken. So what, what, what would be your, your advice now in this state that the church finds itself in? Okay, um, I think that Mweti also has his hand up. Sorry? Uh, Brother Mweti, uh, would you like to ask your question? Then Reverend uh, Maponya can answer all three. Yes, thank you, Prof, for, for the opportunity. Reale Boha Murutika presentation every year. Muruti. My question is based on uh, on the role of the Presbyterial Commission, Presbyterial Commission or the Presbytery. Does it have the power to overrule the decision of the Church Council? Maybe Church Council have, done, have uh, decided on a particular uh, matter and rule on that particular matter. Uh, uh, and the matter did not be a doctrine one, just a, an administrative uh, a matter. Then maybe Muruti filled a grift and uh, present the matter to the presbytery. Then later on the presbytery uh, corrects or, uh, you know, uh, overrule, let me not say it corrects, it overrules that uh, particular decision. And that decision is not uh, an issue of a doctrine, it's just an administrative issue. Uh, thank you. Okay, I think those are three questions. Um, so we're going to hold back Namaste's question for later, President Reverend Pamponia, those three. Uh, Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, let me start with uh, the one of Brother Focus. One thing that I know is that if a certain body makes a ruling and one need to appeal, you appeal to that particular body that took a decision. And if you appeal to them and things does not go, okay, that's when you go to the next to the next broader meeting. In our case, we'll say, uh, maybe mm -hmm. let's talk about the issue of a church council member or the a member in the congregation or Muruti. Like it's sitting in the church council, then if it does not, you appeal to the church council. And now if it does not go well, you go to the presbytery, the same until you reach the issues of, of the synod. And I always hear people saying, like in our case, the general synod, if you have done all these steps, you have exhausted 
all the avenues of the church, then that's where you decide to go outside of the church and seek sort of like legal counsel. And that can only happen when you've exhausted all until the last body that, uh, that, that, that you can uh, appeal, appeal to. I don't know if I, I, I tried to answer, but I'll say you appeal to that very same body that took a, a decision. And on the issue of, of uh, Brother Kena, when, when Christ was uh, like in John, John 17, when he was praying before his, uh, his last days, on, uh, before he, he, he was going to be crucified, when you read John, John 17, especially uh, from, I think from verse 11, when he was praying there, he, he prayed about the unity of the church. And if the church breaks just because people do not agree on things, I think that will, like, that will just be uh, unfortunate. We are not saying that the church can grow. Like the church can grow and we decide, listen, the church has grown. Uh, maybe we, we, we do whatever cessation or whatever, like uh, demarcation, things like that. But if the church really will, 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 will break just because, just because of uh, uh, we didn't agree on things or we are putting our personal matters before the church itself, that will, that will really, really be, uh, like, it will really be uh, like somehow. I was talking to somebody the other day, day and say, listen, ever since the inception of the church, after Pentecost, like the church has been one. It, it, at least here, those who have been called to belong to God, it has been one, it has been running. There were some uh, cont uh, controversies, things that were happening during that time. But the first time when we saw a break up, a schism or a schism, that was in 1053. That was the first time we saw a great break up then. There was something called the Eastern Church which uh, came to be called uh, the Greek and the, and, and the, uh, is it the Greek and Russian and Orthodox. And we have the Western Church that came to be called Roman Catholic Church. And we are from the Western Church and there was reformation after more. There was this and this, the Donatist controversies. You talk about all those things. Like that's when we, we, we saw the first breakup. But then if the church break just because like uh, we, we, we don't agree on things. It will really, really be, yeah, man, it, will be, it will be said because Christ has prayed for the unity of the church. And our Belha confession clearly states that this unity of the church must be visible so that people can see how hatred can be overcome. Because immediately when there is tension and not understanding one another, then hatred comes in into the church. Hatred comes in. And I want to say this thing, maybe I, 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 I don't want to use the word without fear. Like what is happening again now in the Uniting Reform Church in Southern Africa with whatever movement that is happening. One of the things that is there now is there is hatred amongst leaders of the church. And then when hatred is there, it burst us down where we come from. Apartheid, there was hatred. There was hatred for the people of Khan. Then when the Belhag came into being, we say unity shows that hatred can be overcome. Then maybe even in our case, we need to overcome this hatred that is within us. That is why we are where we are as the church. And to Brother Moyeti, I can only say, uh, one of the things that we need to learn when we are members of the Presbytery Commission, the Presbytery, the Synod, whoever, we need to understand the role that that particular body has to play. The Presbytery Commission and the Presbytery has, to, has a role to play and there are issues that can be directed to the Presbytery. There are issues that as the church council, we can just deal with them. And again, if the presbytery receives something from the church council, they can descend and say, no, but this matter, as you are saying, it is just administrative. Just go and, and work it out. If you want us to come and help you to assist in solving this matter, they can do that. 
But if now they interfere, like uh, coming into matters, it can also create decisions that are, 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 are creating some challenges that bring about a break up into, into the congregation. But they must also, like, Commission, the Senior Synodical Commission, General Synodical Commission, General Synodical Executive, we must keep on, keep on, keep on discerning, discerning the will of God in the roles that they've been given by him to serve his people. Then, but again, I think, and I, 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 I can be corrected, the presbytery as the overseer of congregations within their boundaries, I think they do have those powers that the matters that are bringing are brought to them and they make a thorough investigation and they see that no but the decision that we've taken we have taken whether administratively or whether a doctrinally so it is not for the betterment or for the good of the church they can come up and bring another decision saying no for the sake of kereke this is how we should do things thank you Thank you, um, Reverend Maponya. Um, I think this is uh, Brother Ntsele, is it? Namaste. Uh, over to you. Yes, 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 Prof. Um, thank you, Prof, for this. Uh, you know, I've been listening to Prof, to, to, to uh, Reverend Maponya when he, when he talks about these powers which uh, church councils and presbyteries have. Um, to a little bit of an experience I have, um, I don't know what, I, what I'm going to say, whether it's a question or it's a statement, but I, I came to see that in congregations, we having problem with people not understanding necessarily the, the policies which are there in the church to guiding them into decisions they should take and ends, ends up becoming one of the reasons why our church is being the way it is today. Uh, all this mangle moves that is happening. <clears throat> so another thing that I wanted that I want to, 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 to say is that uh, if the church council has the power to make decisions, when, like, how, how, how limited are they? How limited are they? It, to, in to what extent should the church council take decision? For instance, if a minister has done something wrong, like for instance, um, money's missing and he's, 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 he's the reason why it is happening. And there's a problem of, 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 of behavior of the minister into certain things that are done most by most ministers. In how, 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 how powerful in terms of decisions is the church council in terms of that? Because I've seen uh, one, 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 I one my dad, from my... Asma uh, just, just mute your microphone, please. Uh, I've seen I've seen one uh, but in one congregation in my presbytery whereby uh, there's a very serious challenge of, of a minister and the church council into decisions made by the church council. Nothing happens because they are blocked and there is nothing they can do about it while they have a very serious problem. So that is why I'm asking: into what extent is their decision making limited to? I don't know where that makes sense now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone else with another question or comment? I see Reverend Macheta has joined us. Welcome, Chairperson. Any, any other question or comment? Yes, Prof. I've, I've raised my hand there. Eh? Oh, sorry. Yes, Reverend Ditsweni. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah, Prof. I, I think uh, maybe one can just uh, make a contribution based uh, on the practical experience that one can share with our brothers and sisters. 
um, Namaste um, touched on it a little bit, what I wanted to say, that um, these power struggles that he's referring to are created by a perception that when I'm elected in a position of leadership in the church, I therefore automatically have power. And then we all know that um, power corrupts. Um, there are a lot of uh, misinterpretations of how to behave as office bearers <clears throat> when we are in certain offices. And as a minister, my first responsibility is to understand that I am a teaching elder. And then I'm surrounded by governing elders and together with them, I form a church, a church council. But uh, I have come to learn that um, as long as you put the word of God and the church order in front of you, you are likely to, you know, to succeed in assisting, in helping people. Because uh, once I see myself as a powerful person and against the church order where it says Muruti, church elder, and everybody, we are all equal. Christ is the owner and the leader and the bishop or the pope in our church. With that understanding, you don't go to meetings or to you know interventions with the thinking that I'm a judge. My contribution is the ultimate, and people and the you know we still have today, and that worries me a lot. We still have today um, ministers who every time threatens the church council and reminds them how many years he has spent in the theological training, how much he knows, and then he is like an alpha and omega, his word will be final. And I think that is, that is a, a very wrong approach. But once there is a problem, I can give an example and say, like somebody asked, uh, there is an administrative problem where maybe a congregation wants to open uh, or a ministry wants to open an account you know, all those things, I find them having answers in the church order, and some of the issues are having answers in the Bible where there are conflicts, you know, like uh, the debates from the whole morning where church council members are fighting or the uh, tensions that are arising. We have a responsibility as ministers to, to, to come and handle things pastorally more than anything else. But if we we at a certain stage assume the, the, the responsibility of judges um, and forget that we are pastors and then we must handle above everything else, things pastorally in a Christian way, we are going to lose uh, you know, focus of what, what we need to do. I, I have seen it happening many a times where, um, you know, small, small issues, they just, uh, multiply into something that really destroys the church. But it all started with everybody ignoring the church order. My practice, um, if I have to steal from my own experiences, is that I never handled a meeting up to today for 26 years as a minister of the word without the Bible and the church order. Um, and then I will every time, and even if somebody was so convinced, because I have had professionals in the church council who would say, I'm the director in this department. We are doing it this way. I said, no, thanks. I appreciate that. But now in Uniting Reform Church, we've got this set of rules. We've got this policy document. It says one, two, three. Do you have a problem with the approach that the church has adopted to run this matter? You know, you'll find that professional even coming down, calming down and understanding that uh, as a church, yes, this is not a labor relation matter. It's a church has got its own way, the Matthews 18 way, which is which could have not been the case uh, to, to a manager of the bank who wanted the church to solve the problem when the, the teller has stolen money. You know, you, you will come as a church and show that in a church, this is how we are going to do it. You are there to guide, to lead, to give direction. And if we can just not divorce ourselves from that responsibility and become judges at some stages, punish and do all those things. I don't think um, most of the conflicts that we are having, which are very much unnecessary, we would be having. I think uh, th th that is just my little contribution. And then, of course, there was a question on the Presbytery Commission and Rev Maponya correctly said, if and only if each person can understand the role that he has to play, 
because once you are in the perspective commission, you will know that you are not a decision-making structure. Um, they used to say, yes, Nedi, Beslate, and Delahamni. You, you, you have a specific role, but you will never be in a position to take a decision at any stage. Their congregation, the presbytery members that you are working with will always understand that you refer to the church order. And then this is what the church is saying. And you further goes on. If you have a problem with this, this is the procedure to change the, to challenge the church order, to call for amendments. You must do one, two, three. But as we are seated here, we are working like this. I think that will make our lives much easier. Mine has been in most instances because of that approach. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Reverend Ditsweni. Um, now, Reverend Pamponia, I think our time is up. A final question in the chat from Brother Tutu. He seems to have a problem with his audio. He says, presentation is appreciated, Reverend Pamponia. My brief question is amongst the various types of decision-making, for example, autocratic, persuasive, consultative, or co-determinative decision-making, which one should be followed by the church? Saying this, we see that the minister is experiencing hardship in the church council when it comes to teaching. Um, Paponia, you, you, if you'd like to comment to, to Reverend uh, Ditsuenes, <coughs> can, can somebody, uh, somebody's making sorry, a note? Can you just- Sorry, uh, Prof. Sorry, Prof. Can I, before uh, Reverend Maponia concludes? Okay, your um, final, final question, Reverend Moiti. Yeah, it's just a comment for the future. Uh, as the referent Ditsuene has been uh, putting about uh, reminding us of uh, the conflict in terms of the decision making of the professionals that are sitting on the church council that would like uh, things to run in a democratic way. Uh, many a times, even in literature, one will meet the word uh, theocracy. And uh, as a student minister, you know, sometimes one would like to understand what is the way the theocracy, what is its implications. So for the next session or when time permits, can someone just organize a person who will speak on a theocracy and democracy? Thank you, Rev. Uh, Prof. Thank you, Reverend. Right, Reverend Maponia, over to you for the last time. Thank you, thank you, uh, Brother Chair. I think on what Reverend Jitsuini has alluded, uh, I think like he, he has rightly put things uh, like in perspective. And uh, yeah, uh, I think on that one. And on this one of Brother Chutu, I would say uh, this uh, consultative or consensus, you know, like we, we, we run meeting by, by consensus then we know that we are, we are together or even though we, we disagree on things, but we get it, a, a feeling that we are, we are moving together towards whatever uh, uh, direction which we want to, to take as a, as a congregation or as a presbytery, but also, also as the synod. I think the consultative or consensus way of making decision, it really helped because when you come being autocratic, just telling people, uh, even before the meeting starts, we have decisions. We just sit there and say, there is this matter so so, and this is a decision. You don't allow people to, to talk. Then it makes it a problem because now you are not going to be, you are not going to rally your people and you are not going to be followed because people want to be consulted. People want to, to be engaged so that even if you persuade them on something, they get a, a, a chance of saying, no, but I also contributed into that particular discussion. Then maybe if, if, if I need to do sort of like the final, uh, the final statement Prof. will say, <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm engaging here people who, who are ministers, some are going to be ministers. And I said, when I, I'm speaking about uh, uh, the demo lord who said, if you make a decision and you sleep at night, then that is you are in the right path. But if you make decisions and you don't sleep at night, then you must go back and, and engage more and see how can we redirect the decision that we took before. Then somebody spoke here, I think a uh, Reverend Chen spoke about the issue of Matthew 18. And I think there is this other one, uh, you'll help me comrade, 
but there is this other one again in Matthew. There is a text in Matthew uh, that speaks about when you go to the altar, when you go to the altar to offer something to the altar, and in your heart you know that there is something between you and your brother. Go first, go first and, 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 and rectify, or go first and, 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 and deal with that matter before you can come before God. And I'm speaking with ministers and people who are going to be ministers <coughs> who will be making decisions. My brothers and sisters, how do you climb the pulpit on Sunday? How do you stand before people on Sunday? Deep down in your heart, you know that even the decisions that were taken, some of them, they were so scrupulous. Some of them, there was just, like, yeah, they were favor, favor, uh, favor favoritism decisions. You, you wanted to protect so and so and things like that. And you need to make it a point that before you go to the altar, if there is something cracking, go and solve that particular thing with your, with your brother and you come before God. And again, Matthew 18, if your brother has done something that is not okay with you, uh, go to the brother and speak with the brother and say, this is what I thought before you, you, you present yourself to God. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rampampunya. Could I ask uh, Zanele Billa just to say a word of thanks to Reverend Mamponya on behalf of the group, all the students. Ah, thank you very much, Prof. To Reverend Maponia, would like to say thank you, Reverend, for your wisdom. We are always waiting for you to teach us more and more each and every day. May God bless you and your family abundantly. I thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you also for, for inviting me again. Thank you. We, uh, we, we did have at some time to reflect on the first three papers of the day um, before Reverend Maponya started speaking. So we are now at the point where we are going to have our final devotion. Um, unless there's somebody who has an urgent comment to make on the whole day, sort of wrapping up the whole day, um, I'm going to then ask um, Brother Ntsele to, to do our closing devotion. Or uh, maybe, uh, Remit Macheta, do you have, maybe you can just speak a final word and, and close in prayer for us uh, and the benediction maybe after uh, Brother Ntsele has done the devotion. All right, over to you. Uh, namaste. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Prof, I don't know whether my <coughs> audio is, is clear. Uh, I'm, I just got in to my car and I was driving back home. I, I, I... We, we can hear you, not very clearly, it breaks a little bit, but okay, so maybe we should not ask you to pray in that case. Uh, I'll ask someone else after uh, Brother Ntsele's present uh, devotion. Drive, safe, drive, drive, drive safely. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for for this opportunity to give a weight. Um, yeah, our scripture reading. I'm gonna find it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, chapter 4, verse 9. Uh, I have it in a in a, in a Tuana version. Uh, Bale Hakamu Hokiyo. Bale Babedi Bapala Ali Mumwe. Hone Babona Duelo. Uh, let us pray. Mudimu waruna reaulebu kabo pelori ni protoshi. 
ho bane mo dimalukileng ha nesi ka wena ntata rona go tseba mang ke be re le ka ntata ntle mo dimalukileng le repo mo dimalukileng mo mohao banna le basadi ba phela ka wena modimo ntata lukileng re le bohela matla ha mo dimalukileng wa botsitseng ka lo nyatsa tsilena la ka tshe me rata hore mo dimalukileng le tso hola ho le mo futhu le dule o dimarona me le re bontse mo dimalukileng tsela ya nnete le ya bophelo ka Jesu Kriste mrena wa rona Amen. 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 There are just a few uh, colleagues who have their microphones on. Uh, please just mute as Mapula and a few others. Just please mute your microphones. Thank you. Can I continue? Please, please continue. Okay. Um, I'm going to just try and be as short as I can. Um, here we find a story of an old man lamenting about the previous life he lived, worried so much about the things that are done under the sun. And he makes a conclusion to say, life can be a meaningless life based on the things that we do under the sun eh mona mo re badileng teng re fumana mo rena salomoni ale ka hlaisa disadvantage ya o sebetsa o le mo ka pong ya selfishness We find the advantage of fellowship, partnership, self-control, and mutual encouragement between two people. Where, where we read it, it speaks of two people that works together. Unity is something that brings people too close and has fruitful things towards the society, the community, and everything. But Murana Salomoni Uri Halele Babedi Lekopani Impaseuli Sietz and Sina Mulimo Uswana Felantili and Kilifel. I want I, I I read this thing to you guys so that we can look at ourselves from the lamentation Yena Yamarana Salomoni to ask ourselves that we let our pride take us out of people because of the hatred we have. Our selfish minds that destroys people every time, do we allow it to continue? Or do we want to see ourselves being with those who can't help themselves as a church because I believe that the marginalized, the oppressed, they only need us as the church. And the church today operates Today, Kereke, it's at the point whereby it is alone and it does things alone and it does not care. 
about those it should care for. Our church, Uniting Reform Church, in the Article 4, it is stated that URCSA is a selfless community. But in most congregations, what we do, we do things that helps us only, but not those who are outside suffering. As, as, minister, as, as student ministers, we have as well a problem of being self-centered. We use our backgrounds every time in, into how we engage or how we accommodate other people. And I find that personally as a problem. I wish today from all the things that were said that we look at, we look at ourselves and ask ourselves a very serious question to say, am I the person that behaves or that lives according to what satisfies me alone? Because no one can live alone. It is proven medically that a person that lives alone has chances of having a lot of trauma, a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. And which is what our church today is facing. We have a very serious challenge because we do things alone. Morena Salomoni, that he lived his life thinking that he himself alone, he must succeed, he must accumulate. But at this point in time, as old as he is, he reflects and say, but it's useless to live, accumulate many things, do everything in my, in my power. And then at the end of the day, those things goes nowhere. So he looks back and says, but it's meaningless to live a life like that. The best possible life to live as a human being, you must live with other people. That is why he uses a metaphor of hands. That one hand can't survive alone. Because even when it does something and it fails, the other hand will come in into helping this other hand in order to survive. But when this hand is alone, it's useless. There's nothing that this hand can accumulate. Selflessness, it is what God desires from us. Doing things for, for, for other people, it is what God wishes from us. Instead of living a life that we normally do, we take our personal problems to churches. We take our personal things from home to churches in order to address a certain agenda. We've done that, we are doing it, and I believe we we'll continue to do it. We must look at ourselves today and see where are we heading as Christians. And they meet, they get, they become, they get united, but they become united. They are meaningless. Now we must check ourselves, even though we pretend to unite or even though we lie to ourselves that we are, you are, we are, we are more, we, we are united, we must check what are we united about and how effective is that? Because it's pointless to be united and do nothing. I want us to look at ourselves today when we leave here, this devotion. What type of a group are we? What is the meaning of our unity? Are we united because of we want to kill people? Are we united because of we want to drag someone else down? Are we united because of we want to achieve a certain thing in this church or in our lives or at work where we work? Because even though we, get, we become united and do nothing effective, it's quite useless. 
I wish that all of us may understand the meaning of unity. And we live according to that. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Litlukhanolo. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Tawu Twala to unmute his microphone and to, and to close with, with a prayer. And after the prayer, we're just going to have a, a short announcement about tomorrow's program. Brother Twala, please lead us in prayer. All right. Thank you, Prof. Uh, colleagues, let's pray. Mudimuntate, Mudimumora, Mudimumoya, O Hanela, Mudimorona, Reale Boha, Kaleza Tilenana, Rile, Ale Plena, Mudimorona, Impawena, Pintore, Toshi, Tetan, Mudimorona, Arupa, Otto, Shona Fate, Toshi, the Willing, Sestini, and Murut Mudimak, Cocopella Bona, Leba Malapabona, but Lebasho no Fate, Zesalebala, who copper on by two tea. Akragao Mudimu, Refema Talbona Bashalabam Rana Salomon, or Tlebelona Kukisiso, Retar Hono that it was a how Katzela Eucrast Mrana Orna and a Zagati. Mutimorona Rukuta Juale, Mir Rukopana Hapeosani, Mr. Salum Rasan Ru Mema Haber Ebaluna, of Rukopana Hapeosani Mutimorona Rakraste Morena. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Twala. Uh, maybe just an announcement, our program starts tomorrow morning at half past eight. Please let's uh, start uh, logging in from 20 past eight. Is that okay, Brother Zanele? So that we're all um, on board by the time that the, um, that the first presentation starts. Um, and then, um, any other announcements from anyone in connection with tomorrow's program? Okay, let's um, let's make sure that that we all um, uh, link up on time. It's the same link that's going to be used tomorrow as today, and uh, so the um, the meeting will be open from twenty past eight tomorrow morning for all of us to to get in early. All right, that's uh, the day. Um, let me close with a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go well and have a good evening.